In this episode of In The Loop, people seeking health care shouldn't be surprised by their medical bills, and a new law requiring hospitals to display the cost of procedures up front seeks to cut down on that. But coming up, we'll tell you more about how the rate of hospital compliance is still causing trouble for patients. Plus, you might be a diligent recycler, but our planet's plastic pollution has gotten worse and it's disproportionately impacting developing nations. A new Newsy documentary explores the mounting impacts of broken global systems of recycling. This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Busy news day here on the show with all those stories and more coming your way in the next hour. But first, we're not exactly in the business of algorithms, but we're setting up a For You page here on In The Loop. And it says we're starting with TikTok. Your younger relative's favorite app is back in the news again, not for a viral meme or a dance craze, but once again, for national security reasons. In recent weeks, there's been a bipartisan revival of the push to ban or more heavily regulate the app. It's rooted in concerns that the app collects a ton of user data, all of which could be easily accessed by the Chinese government. The concern over China's influence has lingered among US policy leaders. The Trump administration threatened on multiple occasions to ban the app in the US. That included one effort in 2020 that led to the company migrating US user data to servers owned by the American company Oracle. On Tuesday, Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman Mark Warner, a Democrat from Virginia, said he wouldn't want his kids using TikTok and called the app, quote, literally like a communications network for the Chinese Communist Party. And in a November congressional hearing, FBI Director Christopher Wray issued a warning about the app. Do have national security concerns, uh, at least from the FBI's end, uh, about TikTok. They uh, include the possibility that the Chinese government could use it to control data collection on millions of users or control the recommendation algorithm, uh, which could be used for influence operations. As a refresher, TikTok is owned by the Chinese company ByteDance. The company has repeatedly denied any influence over US content moderation by either the parent company or the Chinese government. But reports have shown that the Chinese government has had at least some say in how the app does its business. The Washington Post reported that the Chinese government acted to prevent TikTok from being sold to an American company, and that the company has submitted to required government involvement including sharing its algorithm for TikTok's domestic Chinese counterpart and allowing the government to acquire a stake and a board seat for its domestic subsidiary. And BuzzFeed News reported in June that internal documents revealed that US TikTok user data was repeatedly accessed from China. It didn't specify that it was the Chinese government that accessed it, but even access by a Chinese arm of the business could lead to data being passed to the government on request. The way TikTok's data is handled is a bit of a departure from other tech giants. Google, Apple, Facebook, and Instagram are all American companies subject to US and international regulations on data privacy. Those companies and TikTok all collect user data to run analytics and sell ads. And that data can be pretty wide ranging. TikTok, for example, knows your device, your location, your IP address, your search history, and messages, and what and how long you're viewing content. Again, Pretty normal stuff for using the internet in the 2020s, but what does it mean if the Chinese government might know I'm watching videos about Brexit geezers or dancing along to that Meghan Trainor song? Joining us now to help us put things into perspective is Ausma Bernat. She's a PhD candidate at Griffith University in Australia and an expert on digital surveillance. Her research focuses on how it's governed and how that affects human lives. Ausma, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me today. So let's start off with a data snapshot here. If I were to use an app like TikTok, which I don't, not yet, what would I be making available to them? First is the type of data that TikTok tells us they collect. That's on the official privacy statement that TikTok makes public. And that would include profile information such as your name, your age, your date of birth, phone number, email profile photo profile video sometimes. And by that, I mean the types of videos you watch, the types of videos you like, the TikTok challenges you partake in. Now there's the TikTok also tells us uh, that they would be collecting third party data if you give consent around that. And they would be collecting technical information. And I'll quote here directly from their privacy policy because 
this is quite extensive. So among other data, they would collect IP address, the type of mobile carrier you're using, your time zone settings, model of your device, screen resolution, your battery state, audio state, uh, audio settings and connected audio devices, and even the types of keystroke patterns or rhythms. But that's not it. So there's a second part to the story. And there's a, uh, in August this year, a Canberra-based company called Internet 2.0 they actually looked at the source code of TikTok. The first thing they found was that TikTok does something that's called device mapping. So it retrieves all other running apps on your phone and it gathers all information about the apps that are installed on the phone. And it creates a type of a diagram of your phone. So what I'm understanding is that there is potentially a lot of information that is um, kind of flowing through the app. Um, how does it have national security consequences if TikTok user data falls into the hands of the Chinese government? There's the, the types of concerns that we've already seen play out in reality, that we already have a growing evidence, um, a growing body of evidence to support. And there's the types of concerns that are more hypothetical. So the first type concerns information manipulation on the app. And that's definitely not hypothetical anymore. So we have seen, for example, in 2019, we saw um, lots of news coverage on the protests in Hong Kong. And they were absolutely censored on the Chinese version of TikTok, which is called Douyin. Now, a year later in 2020, there is another Canberra-based think tank called the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. And what they found was that there's lots of different keywords that are being um, censored on TikTok, such as LGBTQ+. And then there's a type of banning or censorship that's called shadow banning. And shadow banning, look, it, it's just as creepy as it sounds, really, because it's a practice where you might put something online, you'll post that, and then you'll be able to see your own post, but nobody else can see that post. We've seen a recent push from voices on both sides of the American political aisle to ban or more tightly regulate TikTok. Uh, briefly here, how feasible is that and what might that look like? Perhaps the best way to do that is just to, for um, nation states or for, for different countries, to look at the privacy policies that are implemented by the country, the privacy policies that govern social media. And that would not only resolve um, issues or concerns with TikTok, that would resolve concerns around different social media that companies that are going to appear pop up in the future. That would be more helpful because that would be more of a structural solution to the problems that are going to be posed by various social media companies. And that's something that we've done in Europe, for example. So we have the general uh, GDPR, general data protection regulation. And that governs privacy protections for, for folks in, in Europe. And that's been a good initiative. Asma Bernat is a PhD candidate at Griffith University in Australia. And folks, as you heard, an expert on digital surveillance. Alsma, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. U.S. concerns about TikTok also stretch to the company's hiring practices. In recent months, Newsy has reported on how workers who have left U.S. intelligence agencies are now getting jobs with TikTok. National security correspondent Sasha Ingber has been reporting on this and has more for us on how it's factoring in the lawmakers' decisions to regulate the Chinese-owned company. Top lawmakers are responding to a Newsy report we brought you last month. We found members of the CIA, FBI, NSA, and other intelligence agencies are choosing to take their skills to Chinese-owned TikTok, despite China being a major U.S. threat. TikTok told us these hires reflect a common practice of bringing in people with expertise in issues like counterterrorism and covert influence. 
Senator Mark Warner, chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, told us it's incredibly disappointing to see former IC personnel working on behalf of the subsidiary of a PRC company. Congressman Adam Schiff says the House's Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, which he chairs, pays careful attention to the risks of former intelligence officers misusing their skills. But Warner acknowledged a potential loophole in oversight, saying it may be appropriate to impose controls on TikTok. The CIA's former acting general counsel agrees. I believe the United States needs to do more in trying to prevent former intelligence officers from going to work for TikTok. Bob Edinger told us that Congress should put post-employment restrictions in place to cover companies that have a significant risk of being controlled by foreign governments like China. He says the CIA is concerned about TikTok, but intelligence agencies are limited in what they can do. Unless they can directly show that the former intelligence officers are going to do something threatening to the United States or threatening to the ability to conduct intelligence, they're limited in how much of a line they can uh, draw on their post-employment. So could they be looking at former intelligence officers who went to TikTok? They certainly could be because uh, when it comes to counterintelligence concerns for their former employees, they have all the authority they need to monitor and keep track of that. Senator Warner also said the U.S. needs to be more thoughtful about attracting and retaining top talent. Government data shows that between retirements and resignations, 14.4 percent of intelligence officers left their jobs last year. That may be low, but it's more than in the previous four years. Now, when it comes to retaining officers, a spokesperson for the CIA tells me that their best tool is their mission, that what they do, no other employer in the United States can offer. They also have a talent center dedicated to this, and they're trying to be more flexible about their workplace habits uh, and also offer a lot of opportunities for travel. But they also say, anytime we lose a good officer, our mission suffers. So we continue to monitor resignations closely. At the same time, they decline to tell me about any counterintelligence steps that they're taking. Back to you. All right, folks, we've got a break coming up. So if you're firing up an app on your phone, be careful with your data. Up next, we're turning our attention to hospitals, including some details on efforts to make sure you know what you're paying for when you visit. Plus, we'll explore the effort to make sure rural hospitals have the funding they need. 